because we are trying to build a cross-platform company, you need somebody who understands iOS technology, which is Objective-C. You need somebody who understands Flash programming, which is for, for the web, for Facebook. And you also need somebody who understands Android, so, which is Java. So, uh, and Andy, Andy is the, is the uh, third founder who basically is an expert in these technologies. So I think, and then you might need a fourth founder who might be an expert in, on the art side. So as I mentioned, the graphic quality, the animation quality, just the bar is getting higher and higher in the space. Uh, so I actually think this is a space where the, the mantra of having only two founders or maybe at max three founders might not be appropriate. So you really need to look at your space and figure out what's unique to your space and how you need to shape your founding team. Um, so the next piece I want to talk about was how, how did we end up raising money. So for us, our path was a little easy to start with because we had created Storm Aid. And when we split up from Storm Aid, um, Rick Thompson was one of our investors. And Rick Thompson, um, he was one of the co-founders of Playdom. And, and as I mentioned, Playdom sold to Disney for about half a billion. His entire thesis well, is on social gaming. So if you're looking to invest, if you're looking for an investor who understands this space, Rick Thompson would be the perfect guy to talk to. Uh, so for him, it was okay. I know these couple of founders. They have done StrongMade. It's one. It's one of the leading pioneers in the mobile gaming space. They are trying to start a new company. So he called us up and said, like, you know, how do I, get, how do I get into this deal? So, um, you know, within a week or so, we raised about two million dollars in a seed round uh, with him. And uh, we made it a little bit competitive for him. Uh, and this is one of the things that I always believe in, which is always have options, always have multiple bidders for everything that you do. Uh, it's, it's a lesson that I learned from a high five, uh, which is you never want to be stuck in a position where you get a term sheet and you don't have another, another alternative. You also don't want to be in a position where you get an acquisition offer and you don't have another bidder. Uh, so so a, as a CEO or as a founder, at least one of the founders needs to be constantly working, uh, whether they're talking to investors or they're developing relationships with potential acquirers. Um, so, so that was our that was a seed round, and that really helped us get Crime City uh, off on Facebook. And then from there, we when we pivoted to mobile, um, it, it was that that money really helped us. Um, and then Series A, we ended up raising from uh, IDG. And um, IDG is, was actually IDG China, as well as IDG San Francisco. So before I go into IDG, there was uh, one interesting uh, incident that happened over, um, so Rick calls us one day and says, hey, listen, I think you guys should raise money. So you're like, okay, that's interesting. We'll talk to you a few months later. We don't think we are ready to raise money yet. So, uh, but he, then he calls the next day and says, oh, I got a meeting in San Domingo. Why don't we just meet them? They're my friends. So reluctantly, two of us go up there. Uh, at 4 p.m. we pitch, and at 6 p.m. we get a term sheet. And, and it's a crazy term sheet, like just crazy valuation. It's only based on our Facebook growth. And, um, and me and my other co-founder, we are looking at each other and saying, what do we do? <laughs> We're totally unprepared. And also, so one lesson that I learned from that, and we ended up not taking that term sheet, and we ended up waiting a couple of months. And uh, one of the lessons that I learned was, while a lot of founders focus so much on valuation that they forget about the terms. So it's more important for the term sheet to be founder friendly, startup friendly, rather than valuation friendly. Like I would, I would rather take a haircut on the valuation as long as I get the best deal terms. Uh, so, and that was one of the reasons. For example, that, that, that um, VC firm wanted one board seat which we were ready to give, but they wanted an observer. I just thought that was annoying. Uh, and then, of course, they, they wanted uh, some participation rights, which we were not ready to give. Uh, so, so I think it's really important to figure out, as a founding team, what you want. And if you're in a position of strength, then it's just better to go with partners that are more, that are ready to work on the better deal terms with you. And IDG actually turned out to be that company, that, that VC firm. So um, the, one of the IDG uh, San Francisco investors, just a $100 million fund here, uh, in San Francisco, he was he was always emailing me. He was telling me about how he was playing the game. He was a crime city level hundred plus. Even even I was not hundred plus. I just couldn't imagine how much 
either money he had spent or how much time he had spent playing the game. Uh, it was just crazy. And, and uh, one day he calls me and he says like, hey, he calls me at 7.30 and he's like, hey, uh, one of our IDG China partners is here and he's in Milbury at the airport. Can you meet him? And, uh, and you have to meet him in like in 30 minutes. And I was like, I don't know why I'm doing it, but let me take the meeting. So I take the meeting and uh, I, meet this, I meet one of the partners from IDG China and I, and I hear their story. It's like over $2 billion fund, uh, primarily focused in China. They funded Tencent. They were actually first money into Tencent. Uh, Baidu and a host of other um, other uh, Chinese startups that have gone on to be multi-billion dollar companies. And in the US, the other investment at that time was Legendary Pictures. And I don't know how many of you know what Legendary Pictures is, the guys behind Batman, Superman, 300, uh, it's, just, it's just amazing. So, um, and, and what they had to offer us was, you know, we are completely non-interfering. We, we will give you really good terms and we will connect you to a lot of gaming startups in Asia so you can learn what's happening in Asia and you can bring it to your games. And, and that actually turned out to be a pretty good deal. And uh, that's who we ended up taking money from. And we ended up raising uh, $20 million from, from them in Series A. It was $80 million plus the $2 million that, that uh, Rick Thompson had given us. So, uh, the other thing about, the great thing about Rick was that he's, he's also been an entrepreneur. I think that's really important. So look for VCs who actually understand your market and look for VCs who've been entrepreneurs before, uh, as long as they're not too meddling. So that's, that's pretty important. So I don't know how you get a feel. So one of the things that I did was, uh, of course you, you do the reference checks on VCs, but then figure out the, the references that they have not given you. And, and definitely figure out the companies that went under, or uh, that didn't really give them the exit that they that they wanted, and talk to those founders. Uh, so, so that will be the true the true feedback that you're going to give when uh, when sort of reality hits in the startup world, uh, how how the particular partner is going to react. Uh, so I think I think that's that's really really important. Um, <laughs> the last thing that we really tried to do in the business was. We tried to figure out, so the, so the biggest problem with, with gaming is while gaming is really exciting, and I was never really a gamer, but I just, I'm totally addicted to my own games. We just, I just keep playing my own games. I guess they're on mobile, so it's really easy to keep playing. But is that it's a, it's a hit-driven business. You're only as good as your last hit, right? And, and actually, Rovio is a great example. Um, so do people know what, what game number was Angry Birds? 51st game. That was the 51st game. The company was going to go bankrupt, right? Do people know the next game that they've launched? Hmm? Yeah, Amazing Alex. See, no one knows. And that's exactly the problem with uh, social gaming companies or gaming in general, right? So you can you can create a massive massive hit. You can get an 800 million, billion dollars, I don't know what the valuation was. But what do you do when your subsequent games are not hits? And, and how do you figure out what were the reasons that made the first game the hit game? So for us, we always knew, just because we had seen this over and over again in the space, we always knew that when we created Fonzio, we would really want to focus on pieces that we could institutionalize uh, in a way where we could just reuse them in subsequent games. So when we launched Crime City on, on mobile, I would call that the base game design. So then when we launched Modern War, we took that base game design and we added about 20% or 30% more innovative things to that base game design. And that became Modern War. So we didn't try to innovate the whole game design. We knew what worked, and then we said, okay, let's try the 20, 30%, and let's A-B test it all the time. Let's first test it, whether do the users react to that positively or not? And when we saw that users reacted to that positively, that then became the next base game design. So that was Modern War, and Modern War was even more successful than Crime City. And then came a third game, uh, Kingdom Age, and that, that was built on top of Modern War's base game design. And again, had about 20 to 30% innovation. So, uh, so we did that with the game design, we did that with our technology platform, 
completed that with our analytics platform. So how could we run these games and operate these games and literally guarantee a 100% hit rate? Because that's what really differentiates the, the guys who can sustain in the gaming space versus guys who will just have hits and then will have, basically will have the highs and the lows. And um, I think that's, that's, that's what's been challenging in our space. And that's why we initially tend to get really good valuations, but then when reality sets in, once you launch multiple games, then your valuations end up tanking because you can't keep up with it. So, of course, we lucked out. Um, we had three hits and then we sold. So who knows how the other games would have gone. But, uh, but hopefully we are, uh, we are launching our, our next game and hopefully that's going to be a hit too. So, uh, but this is, this is really, really hard. And when you're evaluating in business, especially when you're trying to evaluate in the gaming space, uh, this is something that you, you need to figure it out. And this is a repeated question. I tend to ask entrepreneurs who are starting, even VCs tend to ask. So what is in your DNA? What is, either it's in your founder's DNA, or it's in your team DNA, or it's in technology DNA that you're building, that you're going to be able to repeat the success. Right? Um, so from here, I want to uh, quickly switch, switch to the last part, which is I'm going to talk about like what am I seeing today in the space. Uh, so the space is totally in flux right now. It's not clear who the winners are going to be. Uh, Facebook is really trying hard to continue to capture the mind share of developers, but it's hard. Uh, I literally don't know any developer that is focused on Facebook right now. Uh, and Literally everyone either is moving to mobile or is already in mobile. So that is that is kind of the state. And mobile is just exploding. It's exploding faster than we thought it would. So it's and that was like looking back, you know, we moved from Storm Eight to Funzio and focused on Facebook. We I, I, looking back, I literally think like the first year uh, we were just on the wrong platform. So the two hundred ten million dollars, if I look back. We built it in about in about a year and a half. Uh, if you if you include the, the the work that we did on building the Crime City engine, and if you take it from the launch to when we ended up exiting, that was like eight months. So, so I think the stark reality in front of Facebook is that either they got to figure out a way to have a more democratic playing field, and to prevent the user acquisition costs from continuing to. Uh, because they keep going up. Uh, but they're pretty happy right now in terms of the casino genre is doing extremely well on Facebook. So folks who are focused on slots, bingo, uh, poker, you know, some of those companies are doing extremely well. But even those companies are realizing that they need to quickly have mobile place and they got to connect the user base across the platforms. And a few, few companies have succeeded in doing. So I think on Facebook, casino space is a standout. And now, um, another standout is the hardcore gaming space. So, <laughs> text-based RPGs, I would say, were hardcore games, were like mid-core or hardcore games. And then came the casual boom with Farmville, and all developers moved to casual, right? And then the cost of user acquisition went up, the viral channels got completely turned off, and no more were those casual games uh, viable uh, as, as a business model on Facebook. And people went back to hardcore games. So there's a company called Kixai that's doing extremely well on Facebook right now. But that's kind of the only standard example that I have uh, of a company that's doing well. So um, point number one here is that you've got to focus on game design and you've got to focus on technology innovation. You, it has to happen in tandem. You can't just do one or the other. So um, a great example is a game that just recently launched on mobile. It's called CSR Racing. And uh, that's the first game that at least I heard that has crossed the 10 million uh, barrier. So they did 12 million last month. Um, and that's just on iOS. They don't even have an Android presence. So, so the gaming, so uh, when, we, when we launched Crime City, I think if you would do a million to two million a month, that was the top grossing app, probably two million a month on iOS. And that's moved to actually 12 million now. So you can see in about a year's time, that's how quickly the revenue size on iOS is, is improving. Also, the game has, is a 3D game. So 
no longer are we focused on, and it's a first example of a 3D game that's actually successfully monetizing users. Otherwise, there are a lot of companies that build 3D games and they wow Apple and Apple features them, but when you look at the grossing charts, they're nowhere. The game's a complete dud. Um, SGN is actually an example of a company, it was called Social Gaming Network, and they were like one of the pioneers actually of social games on Facebook. And then they moved to mobile, and they built a lot of games focused on 3D technology. And they built these, um, these fighter jet games, really complex 3D. And they would spend a million, two million to build a game, and then the game would be a dud. Uh, so without this balance of really understanding game design, if you're just going to do a pure technology play, you're probably going to fail. So you really have to get both pieces right. Uh, when I say console-like quality, take it with a grain of salt, they're still quite a ways away. Uh, but tablets, it really helps that tablets are doing well. So, but the movement has started towards the console quality. The other reality right now facing um, all app developers, and this is not just mobile game developers. If you have a mobile app that you're trying to get in front of a lot of users, um, the reality is iOS cost of user acquisition is becoming prohibitive. Um, and Facebook is already pretty bad. And um, so what's, what it is doing is it is kind of weaning out the indie developers. The developers who have not been able to raise good money, who don't have substantial VC backing, uh, they are kind of falling off. At the same, same time, one thing to remember here is social changes this a lot. So when when Awards with not Awards with Friends, when OMG Pop launched uh, their game, uh, they they were able to take advantage of literally zero dollar cost of user acquisition, and that was because the game was massively viral and social. So if you can figure out Facebook or if you can figure out turn based games, there are certain genres where that might work. Um, and if you and if you have a hit in your hands, that's the only way you can reduce your cost of user acquisition. But I'm convinced this, is, this will just keep going up. So year over year, this has gone up 25%. Android, so about a year back when I was going and speaking in a lot of conferences, everybody was talking about Android. And now, very few people talk about Android. The reason is, a lot of indie game developers about a year ago entered Android, thinking that it's, it's going to monetize really well. They got a lot of users, but Android monetization compared to iOS is still weak. And it's weak because Android does not have a tablet equivalent of iPad. So until, until a tablet, an Android-based tablet succeeds, I feel there is still going to be a 25 to 35% difference in monetization between Android and iOS. And uh, so, so <clears throat> Funzios, when we were at Funzio, our revenues, over 40% of our daily revenues were coming just from iPad. And I love those users. They love our kind of games, they have a lot of money, they love to engage with these games, and they love to pay. So, so again, um, I do see some startups today that are focusing on tablets, and I'll, I'll talk about it. But uh, just, just closing on Android, one of the things that I've noticed is uh, there's a lot of greenfield opportunities. So there are a lot of genres that are still not done, both in the apps category as well as in the games category. And if you're trying to launch a utility app, Android is actually a good market. So if you look at the top free category on Android, which are the apps in the free, uh, they are mostly utility apps. A lot of them are Google apps, but, um, but mostly utility apps. So games tend to do less well on Android than on iOS for some reason. Uh, so again, if you're just focusing on a mobile app, this might be interesting, though the, the warning here is it's not clear how well those users will monetize. So uh, that's something that you, I guess, when you launch, you'll find out. Um, the, the other thing with Android is it's still, the number of activations on Android is astounding. So uh, I think last year, same time, was about half a million a day. Today, it's a million a day. So, and a lot of that growth is coming international. So in the U.S., about 54%, the latest data I saw was 54% of U.S. smartphone users are on Android. And for example, in Japan, it's about 64%. Uh, so, so if you have an international angle, you have utility apps, 
you can find out where the holes today are, so what's succeeding on iOS and what's not there yet on Android, that's an opportunity that you can tap into. This one I already talked about, but this is a really big deal. And I think the companies that will do well on mobile going forward are the companies that will build for the iPad first. It does not mean that they are an iPad only company or a tablet only company. It just means that they're going to build for that user experience. And because and, user acquisition is still very hard if you're only focused on iPad. So Supercell is a great example. Uh, they, they showed me their, their game and they said, and the game was iPad only. And it's a beautiful game. <laughs> I was like, guys, you just can't launch an iPad. That audience is tiny. You've got to figure out how you do iOS, the whole thing, including the iPhone. And they did, and they're doing extremely well now. But I think they nailed the user experience, they nailed the game design, because they were, fe they were focused on the iPad users. And I'm just praying that Android this year hopefully fixes this problem on their side, and we have a few tablets that come out, which hopefully will do pretty well. Um, so with that, I just wanted to complete my talk. Uh, so that's my uh, email, and uh, that's my Twitter handle. So feel free to send me emails if you have questions. Sit down. We'll have some few questions, I think. Um, thank you very much, Anil, for a great results and insight. I mean, I think a lot of great ideas if you guys are planning to start a, a gaming company. So, how about we just open it to the audience straight um, with our <coughs> who wants to ask? Okay. Um, uh, can you give what's the future you see in Windows 8? Oh, that's a that's a hard one to know. Um, I mean, we right now. I mean, we we don't we're not that bullish on it. So um, as far as as uh, as Gree is concerned, you know, we are platform agnostic. So the more platforms that are launched, the more platforms that succeed, that's really good for the space and ecosystem anyway. Uh, but right now, we are not seeing any numbers uh, that give me enough confidence that Windows will succeed. Uh, but having said that, anyone I talk to speaks pretty highly. Anyone who's interacted with that uh, UI is, um, comes, comes pretty surprised that it's actually pretty good. Uh, but I don't know how successful it's going to be. Uh, I, I have a question on uh, monetization. Uh, now, I have to sort of warn you, my background is more in computing and enterprise software and all that, so my question could be considered naive by you. But anyway, let me ask you. You said that uh, we also want to who are these people who want to pay $5,000 or $40,000, whatever it is. So my question is, who are these people? And uh, how do you market, how do you find these people for you? I mean, what's your marketing strategy? Yeah, so um, it's, so we, we know a few of them. <laughs> and and it's, it's all over the map, actually. It's not obvious who they are. Uh, but if you look at most of our, most of Funzio games, at least, are uh, male-focused games, and it's and PvP, what we call PvP or the battle system, is actually really key to monetization. So it's you go, you fight somebody, and then you lose. Then you have to figure out, okay, how do I win, okay. right? Or if somebody beats you 15 times, you are pretty mad, mm -hmm. and then you open up your wallet and you'll. You'll, yeah, you'll pay $100 and you'll buy all the weapons that you can and you'll go and beat up the guy, right? So, uh, so, so, so yeah, so one of the key pieces why our monetization ability is better than the guys who are more focused on casual. Because casual gaming, social casual gaming, like Zynga's gaming, games are very, very much focused on self-expression, customization. They're not focused on battle and fighting. Uh, because they're geared more towards women. So uh, we found, we along with other developers like Kabam, Kickside, we found this, the male audience is actually pretty good and it's a lot of, like Zynga is completely not tapped into it. Um, and, and if you provide a fight system that's really engaging, uh, you can monetize that really well too. Okay. My second question in the same yeah. night is, uh, tell me in the top two gaming companies who are public and are successful, and the top, the other two who are not successful, and why? Top two gaming companies yeah. that are public, that are successful. Well, that's a hard one. I mean, the the one that that is consistent is is obviously Activision Blizzard, 
right? So Activision successful. I, I don't even know who the number two is going to be. I would say Gree is uh, the leading in, leading company in social mobile gaming. We are um, in terms of market cap is is the company that we ended up selling to. Uh, but Activision, at least in the traditional space, has really shown that they can they build IP that's lasting for years and years, decades, and they can keep squeezing out more and more money from the same IP over and over again. So what about Zynga? <laughs> um, I think Zynga. Zynga is definitely in a tricky spot. Um, as I said, that they need to figure out mobile. And, and uh, just actually in some ways, just like Facebook, right? So both those companies have to figure out uh, mobile. And I think they can, uh, but the DNA needs to switch a little bit. So my question is, considering that Rubio Angry Birds creator is not able to create hit after hit, creating hit after, after hit is not an analytics play. So how, what's the secret behind creating hit after hit if it's not analytics? Well, I, I hope for Rovio's sake that they will create more hits. So, uh, yeah, um, no, analytics is actually a really, is, is actually a key piece to it. Uh, but it's, it's not just analytics. You have to innovate on, on mul at multiple levels. So you have to innovate on game design. So for example, Zynga is now getting a lot of flack on the same energy mechanic over and over again. So all the games are now starting to look the same. People are just tired of the same mechanics over and over again. So uh, my point is just that you have a core base game design. Think about it as, you know, that's your foundation. But then how do you figure out what the delta needs to be every single time you launch a game? Where are you going to innovate? And it doesn't need to be disruptive. It can be incremental innovation. And the guys who figure out what the delta is and can then develop a game and showcase it in a way to the user that looks very different. So for example, when you play Crime City and you play Modern War, um, few people can make out like, wait a minute, the online game is kind of the same. Um, because the feature set that we have in Modern War is a little bit different and the look and feel is completely different. That's important. <laughs> I, um, uh, I have two questions actually. One is, what do you think of the in-app purchasing uh, trends in, on the Android platform, are they, are they getting somewhere? Are they becoming good? Uh, is it mostly provided by third party or uh, since Android was not very actively, Google was not very actively pursuing that in the early releases of Android? And my second question is you, you talked a lot about the trend moving from Facebook to mobile and social gaming. But when we talk about social gaming, doesn't Facebook kind of automatically fit in? It seems like an oxymoron. Without Facebook, how how somebody doing social gaming? So can you please talk about that a little bit? Thank you. Uh, great questions. So uh, in-app purchases on Android. Yeah, so it, actually if you take out iPad from the equation, Android and iPhone are quite similar. So I, I just want to make sure that people are not getting it wrong. They're actually quite similar. But so, and you will also see a lot of entrepreneurs uh, talk about the fact that Android is monetizing as well as iOS. Take that with a grain of salt, that, that is my point. Because they're comparing iPhone to Android. They're not comparing iPhone plus iPad to Android. And that changes the equation, right? So, so that's, that's one. Second is, uh, Google's had some challenges with its uh, risk engine. So their whole Google Wallet was built for e-commerce. It was never built for in-app purchases or virtual goods transaction. And uh, we at Fonzio, we used to have quite a bit of issues with the risk engine. So it would, like somebody would want to make a $20 purchase, instantly the risk engine would flag it, and it would, there would be a, instantly the payment would be canceled. Uh, but I know that the Google Android team works really hard on trying to move that risk engine uh, to to customize it for in-app purchases and virtual goods transactions. So I think overall it's improving. The last point there is um, Android really does a great job with direct uh, to carrier billing, and uh, so the only uh, one of the large uh, carriers they don't have AT and T I think right. Oh, they don't have Verizon right now, but they have AT and T, T Mobile, Sprint. So I think once this direct to carrier billing uh, happens. The payments will will come in a lot better. Uh, and your second question was. Second question uh, was, 
you had talked about <coughs> social gaming moving to mobile right, right, right. from Facebook. So yeah, so that's a, that's a good, um, yeah, I mean, we do believe, yeah, that Facebook is is going to be the social threat. Uh, but, but here's a funny example, which is in our games, Fonzio games, we used to have a friend code system. So every player is given like a seven, I don't know whether it's a seven digit or nine digit number. And you can share that number and that's how you become mafia members or alliance members. And if you read our reviews so or you go to our forums, you will see forums with thousands and thousands of posts where people are just posting their code. Because we have engineered the game in a way, and this is, actually RPGs are inherently social. And actually traditional gaming is inherently social, which is you need clans, you need guilds, you need mafia, and our game is based on if you don't have X number of friends, you won't even get access to certain pieces of content. So people were forced to share these friend codes and through these friend codes, they became friends. They probably don't even know who they are. They don't even know their real names. And uh, the other surprising thing we did was in our game, um, I looked at our Facebook data, and I looked at um, our own data with the friend code system. So the number of friends created, or the number of mafia size, is 2x higher with the friend code system than what it was on Facebook when Crime City was on Facebook. Um, uh, here. Um, so as uh, you kind of answered uh, one part of the question about um, uh, distribution. So uh, the distribution and monetization and so specifically with Funzio and some of the games. I'm kind of interested to hear what kind of strategies that you used and you kind of said gaming, uh, especially uh, these types of games that you, you could be building are inherently social. But I uh, would love to hear other kind of uh, distribution strategies that you've used that have worked well. Yeah, we, we raised a lot of money. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, by the time we ended up launching on mobile, uh, it was, it was, I think the impression was that there could be another mobile game company that could succeed. Because just the cost of user acquisition had become pretty hard. And the incumbents, whoever had a large user base, uh, just sort of dominated the charts. But that trend which I mentioned, that social casual, is no longer as lucrative as it used to be on Facebook. The truth is, even on mobile, mobile's moved way faster than Facebook. So in Facebook, that transition took about a year to happen. In mobile, it happened by the time we ended up launching Crime City on mobile, these guys like Pocket Gems, Tiny Co., which is Andreessen Horowitz backed, um, even Stormade, which has a Team Lava brand, um, they, all the casual games were not doing as well as they were just you know, six months ago. So we have seen that trend move to mobile a lot faster. So most developers are moving away from building these massively casual games, and they're moving to building these mid-core, hardcore games. And in terms of marketing, user acquisition, so we spent a lot of money. These were big budget launches. Um, and, and then so we, we spend a lot of initial money, we go up the ranks, and we try and get as many users as we can. And then from there, we move to a model where we are constantly buying users uh, as long as the cost of user acquisition is lower than our lifetime value of the user. So uh, there's no right answer. We use like 30, 35 ad networks. Um, but that's the reality right now. Unless you have a crazy social viral game. Hello, um, thanks for your talk. Uh, your, your point about having the faith that even if, it, if your company fails that you'll figure it out actually is very motivating. And, uh, Thank you for that. Um, so two questions, if you don't mind. One is, is there any gaming that you've seen political campaigns use to try to drive voting or their, um, you know, their their business? And, and the second question is, how do you how do you balance the features with the limitations of hardware so that the hardware doesn't, you know, s stop or become a problem in the gaming? Yeah, in, in terms of your first question, I, I, I'm not aware of such an app. Uh, sounds like a good idea and sounds uh, very relevant, at least right now. Uh, so you, you, get, you get quite a lot of users with that. So if you have something that's very current and <laughs> that people are looking for, or you have IP, actually we are, we are becoming more and more bullish on brands and, and IP that can help reduce your marketing cost. Um, in, uh, sorry, what was your second question? 
hardware. Yeah, so, so in terms of the second question, the, yeah, I mean, we do focus on that quite a bit. Uh, but the challenges are, there are users that are, for example, on <coughs> iPhone 3, iPhone 3G, iPhone 3G, iPhone 3GS, iPhone 4, and iPad 3, iPad 2, iPad 1. So, so it all depends on who you want to focus on and what kind of mass market appeal are you going for. So if you're going for everybody, then you will need to test on each device. And we try and optimize it. So for example, now we are trying to be iPhone 4 and, and above. Um, but we still support certain iPhone, iPhone, we still support to some extent iPhone 3 users. So for example, iPhone 3 users can get into a game, they can at least like download it and load up you know, some part of the game. Um, but pretty soon, most likely the games will crash or it'll run out of memory. But that's, but again, the reason we do it is because we can get that download and that download helps us go up in the rank, right? So it all depends on your cost benefit analysis. Now, the, the cost, you could pay a big price for it. And the price you could pay is people might start rating your app very negatively. It's a pretty bad experience and we don't want to do it necessarily. So that's why going forward, we don't, we don't want to do it. Uh, so basically what that means is somebody will download the app, it's not going to run, they're going to give you a one star. So you don't want that to hurt you. On Android it's like, it's crazy a, a challenge. I don't know what that number is, at least like we see 1500 plus devices. Um, and, and we can support only so many devices. And we can even just imagine the QA team, right? How many devices can you actually support? And can, how many devices do you want them to test on? It's, 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 it's insane. So we tend to focus on, you know, the 80-20 rule. And it tends to work out. So, when you drop off a long tail application as a long tail support, will cut it off? Um, we follow a 80 20 rule. So, that's what we focus on. Hi. Um, you talked about the different segments uh, that, that exist and the different genres. Uh, so, for, have you looked at the, um, you know, the, the college or pre college audience? And uh, do you find that there's a certain kind of genres? Do you think they're attractive? What platforms are good for them? Which genres might be applicable? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, definitely iPad, iOS um, is is a really good platform. I'm actually pretty bullish on the on the pre. I don't know what you want to call it. The, the toddler age or is that is that what you're thinking? High school. Okay. Yeah. The, the business model, the platform, like yeah, high yeah, school yeah. and. Um, yeah. I think Android, first two years of college. Yeah, I think they are supporting a subscription model. Um, I'm not sure which platforms are that you will need to look into. I know Facebook just rolled out a sub subscription model now. Um, so yeah, so you should look at. Um, so by the way, all, a lot of these kids pay, and the way they pay is it seems to us in and in doing some in talking to some some of these kids, is the parents give them an allowance. So every month you can spend twenty dollars on on your on any apps that you want, right? And so they use their parents' account, and that's how they end up paying. Um, and some of these games, like Smurfs Village, got into a lot of trouble uh, because some of these parents started suing, <laughs> started filing a lot of complaints against Apple and against the app developer. So, um, so I think the opportunities where I see uh, that I see are pretty interesting is in the education space, is in um, even language learning. Is pretty interesting. So somebody wants to learn Spanish, somebody wants to learn Mandarin, somebody wants to learn, um, you know, Italian or whatever. That's actually a, a pretty interesting market. Um, I also think uh, just basic uh, learning games is is another space that that could be very interesting. And you just have to figure out if the platform supports um, a subscription model. That that's a pretty interesting application. Okay, let me ask a question. Um, so you mentioned earlier that in Japan they're a few years ahead and also they're making lots of money. So uh, in terms of game mechanics and monetization, so can you uh, talk about some of those areas? How do you think they're ahead in terms of the American market? Yeah, so um, so in Japan, so one thing that uh, we sort of in the U.S. never went through was the, uh, was the feature phone era. So in Japan what happened, okay, so we you had the Nokia's of the world, then you had the feature phones, and then you had smartphones. We just went from like the Motorola Razor to the iPhone, right? So we skipped that that feature phone generation, or era. And in Japan, 
that's why they are like literally I think I don't know what the number is now but it's literally I think 50% of the of the user base is still using feature phones and and they're all moving to Android or moving to iOS so because of that and because a social network uh, was launched the social network green was actually a social network that was launched just for mobile phones and then they figured out uh, back in 2006 or 2007 that they should build games so so what they really understand is having a user base that is it's like basically think about Facebook and Zynga combine them and put them on mobile that's who Gree is so they understand social networking they understand how to keep sending users to the best performing apps and then they understand how best to retain those users and how best to monetize the users and the way they tend to monetize also is and these are the advanced techniques that they use is they run something what I call live ops or every single day there is some event going on in the game so and the event could last for a day it could last for three days and if you complete the event in three days you get this crazy epic item in the game right so people are really fighting to, com to complete these events they have like uh, ads on TV at like 1 a.m. where they'll show a QR code and the people who take that QR code, snap the QR code, only those people get access to certain areas in the game or certain uh, items in the game. So they are like crazy advanced and nearly 50% of all TV advertising in Japan is social games. Wow. Which is crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, last question before we, um, you know, we'll give break to Anil. <laughs> Me. Hi, this is Piyush. Uh, quick question, you talked about data-driven approach and analytics. Can you uh, delve deeper into what, what type of things that you learn and uh, what's the analytics platform that uh, you deployed there? Yeah, so we use uh, Tableau and Bordica. Um, and I, I believe a lot of successful gaming companies, that's what they, they use uh, typically. And um, so, we, so what we, it's, it's multi-layered approach. The first layer is, you know, the macro, like the things that the execs want to look at. So those are the dashboards, right? What are the sort of the heartbeat metrics? And I would call them like monthly active users, daily active users, retention. So I would divide it into just sort of how the traction is in your apps, how are you retaining users, and then how are you monetizing users. So those are the three basic layers. And then for every game, you would you can take it one level deeper. And that would mean, so that's what I call the game analytics, which is really slicing the game and seeing, okay, how quickly are players moving through levels? Where are most of the users dropping off? When do they start paying? When, uh, what are they purchasing? And, and then I think it gets into the more interesting stuff. So some of the things that we are investing in is doing some sort of predictive analysis. So, can somebody do, if somebody does these three actions, what's the probability that they will do why? Um, another interesting thing is, uh, you know, looking at people who actually use Facebook to connect or who use friend code to connect. You know, how is that, how does that cohort differ from the cohort that does not do that connection piece? Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's, it's awesome. Like, you can just like live and breathe that all day long <laughs> and because we are collecting just so much data and it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So you've been able to change behavior by measuring and then increase your monetization as well? Yeah, we, and it's not all about monetization. We actually first focus on retention. So, so it's, always, it's always looking at the funnel and the funnel always starts from you acquire the user and then you gotta retain them. So actually, you know, when we do the soft launch in the beta, we don't even look at monetization, we don't care about it. We're only focused on the first thing is, is this game high quality, has it surpassed users' expectations that they're gonna come back the next day, right? That's the first test. And if you can get through that one day retention test, seven day retention test, then let's talk about monetization. So that's how we kind of move. So let me, uh, before we finish today's program, I wanted to um, just tell you one of the statements which Anil had made in, I think, an article which is done for MIT on the viewership center. So uh, the, what you said was, don't let anyone tell you that you can make something happen. Whether it's a teacher at school, your family, or a venture capitalist, 
So with that, let's give you a big round of applause. And we'll